Well, 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 fancy seeing you here. Welcome, uh, happy new year. This is 2021, the first day, uh, as you're gonna be watching this video. And, uh, and this is our regular Friday news update, but I wanted to do something a little bit different because I'm sure you've heard the FAA finally released new regulation for remote ID, but also for other things. And so um, I took the last couple of days going through all the regulation and uh, I wanted to do a video that's in depth. Now you guys know what we do at Pilot Institute. We teach you to uh, go over things in detail. We don't just believe in passing the test. So this is gonna be no different. So this is gonna be a little bit longer than usual, but I have four topics that I wanna talk about today. The first one is remote ID, obviously the new regulation. The second one is the regulation that covers flying over people and flying over moving vehicles. And then flying at night and flying uh, for recurrent training. There was new regulation for this. And then lastly, I'll talk about other Part 107 regulation that has changed recently. So let's get going. All right. The first thing this week, really, uh, before we even get into anything, this is going to take a while. Like I mentioned in the intro, this is uh, what we do. I like to go over things in detail. Uh, I could have done a video a couple days ago, but I know a lot of people did. A lot of people covered the basic things that uh, we could see in the, uh, in the summary that the FAA gave. But the FAA gave also a lot of other documentation. Like they always do when they release new regulation, they always publish what's called a preamble. And the preamble is just a lot of explanation as to why the FAA did what they did. So I took my time. I went through uh, pretty much reading the entirety of the preamble handbook, which is about 800 pages. And, um, and I sat down and I put a whole bunch of information together. So grab a drink, cup of coffee, cup of tea, a uh, glass of wine, beer, whatever it is that you do, and then sit down and enjoy. Now at any time, I know this is going to be pretty long, at any time if you want to get more information about a different topic or if you want to go back, you can go down there in the comment section in the description of the video and you'll see there's different chapters with different timestamps. So I'm going to put as many timestamps as I can down here so that you can navigate and go to the areas that you're interested in. So let's um, let's get going kind of you know this video is designed for our students and our YouTube followers I designed this so that you have a good understanding of the new regulation not not only just the regulation but I also wanted you to kind of get an idea of why things were the way they were originally and then how the FA kind of changed it in the new regulation so like I said I went through 800 pages of reading. Now, reading is one thing. Comprehending is something else. It's kind of like the difference between hearing and listening. Uh, reading all the documentation is one thing, but I had to go back several times, especially when we're going to talk about flying over people. Uh, I think this is the most confusing uh, portion of the new regulation. Uh, I had to go back several times. I created tables for you so that you can see the comparison between all the different categories. I made a timeline so you have a better idea of how uh, flying at night is going to work. Uh, so I I try to make this as this is what we do flight training made easy right this is our motto so I try to make it as easy as I can on you guys so you don't have to go through 800 pages now I'm not gonna lie some of it was painful some of it I kind of skimmed through because uh, it was things that I'm not necessarily interested in things that you may not be necessarily be interested in uh, such as all the compliance thing for remote ID so I skipped that portion uh, not skip but I kind of skimmed through uh, but um, but there was actually a ton of really good information and uh, and it was really good to get into the brain of the FAA using the preamble and kind of understand why they did what they did. Now you may ask me, Greg, what do you think of the new regulation? And overall, I'm going to say I'm pretty happy. Uh, I was very worried about the NPRM as many of you were. Uh, we submitted comments and, uh, and I have to say the FAA did listen to a lot of the comments. So it's not perfect by, by any mean, not perfect by any mean, but uh, this is something that I can actually live with as a remote pilot, um, as an educator, and as a commercial pilot, professional pilot, flight instructor, uh, this is a regulation that I think is decent. Let's put it this way. Now, I'm not going to try to put too much of my opinion into the regulation. I want to give you facts. This is what we do. Uh, I, I prefer to give you facts rather than uh, diminish the FAA, make fun of the FAA, or, or other things. So I'm going to give you just information and hopefully you do whatever you want with it. Um, 
the FAA, I, I need to mention this, but some of the regulation will be out there very soon, like the night stuff, uh, the, the flying over people, uh, some of it will be, but a lot of it will take some time. And then some of it will take years, like remote ID. So uh, this is not something that you have to worry about too much at the moment. Uh, we still have actually several years before any of this comes into play. So I, I wouldn't worry too much and, uh, and get gray hair over this stuff. I'm getting gray hair. Uh, the FAA still has a lot of questions that they haven't answered in the regulation and that they will answer in the future. So uh, let's uh, kind of get going with this. Um, the, I've got three pieces of information I want to share. The video today is going to be in-depth, it's going to be pretty long. And then on Sunday morning, this coming Sunday in a couple of days, uh, January 3rd at 11.30 Eastern, I'm going to have a Q&A, live Q&A for you, for, for our students, uh, so that you can answer, you can ask questions. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm uh, by no means an expert. I've been following Remote ID for a long time. I wouldn't call myself an expert, but I've been reading regulation for the uh, best part of 20 years now as an aviation professional. So I know how to read the regulation. I did read all the regulation and I know where to find the information. So I'll have answers for you. I know there's going to be questions I'm not going to have answers to. So I'm going to write down these questions from the Q&A on Sunday morning. And then next week, I'm going to uh, have a, uh, a video with Vic Moss. You remember Vic maybe from a couple of videos ago from the Drone Service Providers Alliance. And, uh, and Vic has agreed to join me and then, uh, and then we'll talk about all of this new regulation. Vic had access to the regulation early by uh, being a member, being the, the, uh, the uh, I want to say CEO, I think Vic is the CEO, I hope I didn't mess that up, uh, the CEO of the Drone Service Provider Alliance. And uh, he had early access to the, to the regulation and he created articles and I'm going to put down in this video so that you can watch the articles. It's more condensed than the video that I have obviously, but it's really good information and uh, he's one of the persons that I trust to get this information correct and share it with you guys. So uh, so three videos, this video this week on, um, on uh, Sunday, we'll have a live Q&A uh, on YouTube that you can join, ask questions. I'll be here to answer as long as it takes. And then on uh, the following week, we'll meet with Vic. And I'm sure there will be more videos. If you're watching this uh, in, in the middle of 2021 or even later, uh, we'll have more content in the meantime. So um, some of you have asked already, so I'm going to answer that question before I get into the information. Uh, course update. Yes, we will update our course. We actually started already uh, with a new regulation. Uh, some of the information will be there very soon. Some of the information will take more time because it's not until uh, several years down the road. So we'll add it as we uh, feel like it's necessary for you to know. And, um, and we're always going to have the information before the, re the FAA requires it. So uh, there's going to be some stuff that's going to be on the FAA exam, the initial exam, soon, soon being uh, sometimes in the middle of March. Uh, we'll have training for you guys to take care of this. And then uh, anything before there's going to be questions on the FAA exam, we, you will get the training through our course. So if you're already a paid subscriber, then uh, you get updates for free and you get lifetime access. So everything is going to be located right here. Okay, well, let's uh, talk about the first topic. The first topic is remote ID. So let's talk about the regulation around um, remote ID. And I'm going to answer a few questions first uh, that I know are going to pop up. Uh, yes, the FAA did listen. Uh, the, the result of this are mostly good. Mostly, okay. Uh, no, your current DJI, hotel, Skydio, whatever it is, is not going to be bricked, okay. It's, it's still going to be uh, operational with the new remote ID uh, regulation. No, you don't have to return your Christmas gift that you just got. Don't worry about that part. And uh, yes, you should buy your next drone today, tomorrow, next week, next month. You don't have to wait for the next remote ID compatible drone at this stage. And uh, no, the regulation is not going to go into effect until the middle of 2023. 2023, that's right. So another several years down the road before this happens. And yes, the Mavic Mini and other sub-250 drones are going to be exempt from remote ID, but, there's a big but, but only for recreational purposes. If you fly the Mini for under Part 107, it has to meet the requirement for remote ID. So you need to get that out of the way so that you can have a better idea of what's going on. I wanted to give you a quick timeline 
and and this was not easy because it's not easy because we still have a date that has to be published that is still to be determined that we don't know, which is the date that the regulation is going to be posted on the federal register, which is kind of what starts the entire clock. Now, with that being said, we can have an educated guess. Sometimes in January, the regulation will make it to the register, which makes it basically official. It means that you can start to follow the regulation or you have to follow the regulation in some cases. So, um, so remote ID, more than likely, sometime in January will be posted in the federal register and then it kind of starts the clock. Um, 60 days later, in March 2021, is when the regulation is going to go into effect. So March 2021 is kind of when things need to start happening, um, some of it. September 2022, which is uh, 18 days, 18 months, I'm sorry, 18 months after the publication, that's when the UAS manufacturers have to start to comply, which means that if you buy a drone by September of 2022 is when the manufacturers have to make those drones compatible with remote ID. So that gives them time to ramp up things and, and make it happen. Um, you, as an operator, don't have to comply with it until September of 2023. Now, that date of September, there's going to be a specific day, which is all going to depend on when the information gets published uh, on the federal register. So sometimes in September, it could be October. It could be a little bit earlier than that. I doubt it will be. But September, October timeline is when we should see uh, these things going into place. So obviously, we'll get more information as we get that date sometime in January of 2021. Um, now, you can start to comply with it anytime you want, starting from that March deadline. So sometimes in the middle of March, you should be able to start to comply with remote ID if you wanted to, which is not required until September 2023. You're going to say, why would people do that? Well, we'll talk about early compliance uh, in, the, in the next uh, slides. So how does this work? Well, the FA is publishing new regulation, which is called uh, part 89. So this is a new regulation. We, we, you're familiar with part 107. You may be familiar with part 48, 47, part 91, all that stuff. Uh, so now we have new regulation in part 89. They are also making some amendments to part 1, which is definition, to part 47 and part 48, which is the registration uh, regulation, and then to part 91, which is mostly for ADSB stuff. Part 91 is for manned aircraft, and, uh, and then obviously some amendments to part 107 as well. Uh, the final regulation was a stack. I have a copy of it right here. I actually printed it. I, I like to read stuff in printed format. Uh, I, I put a bunch of tabs. Obviously, I took a lot of notes in here. Uh, this is 470 pages. This is the entire executive summary plus the final ruling. And then it has the preamble in here, which is the information that uh, where you can kind of answer the questions. If you have questions about why did the FAA do this or what does this exactly mean, it's going to be contained in here. So uh, lots of very valuable information in there. Let's talk about some definitions because the FAA kind of defined new things or clarified some things. Um, they have two terms now. They have the term UA, unmanned aircraft, and then they have the old term, unmanned aircraft system. Unmanned aircraft is going to be the aircraft itself. This is a little Mavic Mini 2 right here. Um, that's the unmanned aircraft. If you add the controller, the control station, then it becomes a system, the entire thing. So they had to make this distinction for several reasons. And then we have the term broadcast. Broadcast is defined as follows. It says to send information from an unmanned aircraft using radio frequency spectrum. So that's, well, that that's going to come into play in a minute when we start talking about, um, about remote ID. Uh, they added another term as well, home-built unmanned aircraft. And this is something that um, was somewhat confusing in the NPRM. And I'm going to read you the definition. An unmanned aircraft that an individual build solely for education or recreation. Now, I do have a question already about this, and it's somewhat unclear in the regulation. And my question is, um, what if you build a home-built aircraft for uh, the purpose of commercial purposes, okay? Not recreational, not educational. And there is some hints in the preamble, but it's not 100% clear. So hopefully we'll get some clarification on this. Or maybe I missed it. it it's entirely possible. It's been a heck of a last two days. Um, the term declaration of compliance, DOC, you'll hear this term a lot, de de uh, declaration of compliance. This is a record that's going to be submitted to the FAA by whoever is creating standard remote ID 
uh, technology, whether it's a remote ID aircraft or a remote ID module, we'll talk about the module, a little dongle that you're going to put on your drone, uh, to basically attest that it meets the requirement in subpart F of the regulation of, of, of part 89. It's basically information that DJI, for example, is going to be sending to the FAA to tell them that they're complying and how they're complying. So declaration of compliance, you're declaring that you're complying with the regulation. So let's get to the regulation itself. Three different methods that uh, you can use to comply with remote ID. The first one is to buy an aircraft that's going to be equipped with what's called standard remote ID. You're going to buy one of these little things right here and then on it it's going to say it meets the requirement for standard remote ID. At this stage, this is a broadcast method only. I'm going to get back to this in a second, but this is super important because, and you can see him probably smile, uh, this is something that uh, a lot of us have told the FAA we wanted, and I'm surprised that they listened, but they did. But we'll talk about the details. Uh, the second method is to install a remote ID module. The module is going to be this little dongle that you're going to put. This is not a dongle, but uh, it's going to be smaller than this, but something that you're going to slap on your drone, and that's going to basically make it uh, compatible with remote ID. Uh, this is a way that you can retrofit older aircraft. Older aircraft or newer, older, home-built aircraft, you'll be able to have this little dongle, a module. I'm going to call it module because that's the terminology. Um, the third method is to be able to fly at a FA recognized identification area. It's called a FRIA. So if you hear me say FRIA, it's going to be a site that the FA has said, yeah, you can fly there without remote ID, it's safe. Think about your uh, AMA field where people are just flying uh, um, aircraft that uh, are not going to go beyond visual line of sight, that don't really need to go anywhere. Uh, the, the classic, I'm going to call them the, the classic flyers, uh, can be able, can, can fly out of Fryer without getting any additional equipment, no dongle, no module, or not having an aircraft that complies with remote ID. So that's kind of, that was in the NPRM, that they've made some changes that are pretty good. Um, some of the regulation overview here, no, you cannot use ADSB as a method to comply for, uh, for remote ID. ADSB, for those of you that are not familiar, is the technology that is used by manned aircraft in order to be identified. The FAA has said we're not going to use ADSB because it's going to congest the airwaves, uh, it's going to congest the system in itself, and, uh, and we're just going to have remote ID as a separate uh, system. Uh, I'm not against the idea, I think it would have made it very convoluted and very uh, busy for the signal, so not something that's going to happen, which is good. Uh, there's no more internet or network requirement. I'm going to say that again, and then you can cheer and sing. Uh, there's no more internet or network requirement. Uh, if you've been following uh, us for a while, you know that um, one of my big complaints, and not only me, but a lot of other people, was the fact that the FA wanted to require internet uh, connection for the drones to fly. And uh, that was going to be expensive. That was going to require a USS, a, a US um, unmanned aircraft system service supplier. That's all gone. The FA has uh, scrapped that portion. So that's good. Uh, so that's kind of the overview. You're going to say, who is going to comply with remote ID regulation? Very good question. All unmanned aircraft that need to be registered are going to have to comply with remote ID. So what does that mean? Any unmanned aircraft that are under 55 pounds, 55 pounds not included, have to be operated and that are operated under Part 107 are going to have to comply. Okay. This little sub-250 gram drone, if it's operated under Part 107, it needs to be registered, which means that it needs to have remote ID. All aircraft that are over 250 grams, so 250 grams not included, over 250 grams and under 55 pounds, I shouldn't say 250 grams, by the way, 0.55 pounds, it's what's in the regulation. But I like, I don't like 0.55 and 55, so I'm going to say 250 grams. 250 grams under uh, 250... Uh, under 55 pounds. If they're operated for recreational purposes, they have to meet remote ID. This little thing right here, if it's operated as a recreational pilot, you do not need to have remote ID. Okay, so pretty simple. Operated for part 107, need remote ID. Not operated for part 107, you don't need remote ID. Um, any unmanned aircraft that are used for public safety, I know a lot of you that follow uh, our public safety students in our course, uh, same thing, you're going to have to comply with that portion. Now, there's two different exceptions. 
One exception is anyone who's flying for the federal government. So for the United States government, does not have to comply with the remote ID. State, local, tribal governments have to, rep have to comply with remote ID. Okay, so only federal government. If you state, local, or tribal government, then you have to meet the requirements. Again, it's all based on regulation uh, for Part 47, Part 48, which is the registration regulation. So if you have to register your drone, you're going to need to use remote ID. That's the bottom line. Uh, the other exception is for unmanned aircraft that are designed uh, and produced for the purpose of aeronautical research. And aeronautical research is very specific in this case. If you fly for a university, uh, you're, not going to, you're not going to fall under this category. Aeronautical research is somebody who's doing research for remote ID purposes, for example, something like that. Then they would be exempt in this case. The aircraft manufacturers that are designing these aircraft are going to be able to design an aircraft without meeting the requirement. Remember how I said that DJI, Hotel, all these companies, they're going to have to uh, comply with remote ID and create drones that have remote ID technology in it. In this case, they would get an exemption if they design those aircraft for aeronautical research. With that being said, I found interesting, I found a line somewhere, I should have written the page down, but it basically says that even if you are doing aeronautical research, in this case, you would have to install a, a remote ID module on it to comply or you would have to fly at a fryer. So my guess is that if you're doing aeronautical research, you have access to a fryer and then you would fly at a fryer without remote ID. But that, I'm, I'm guessing this is not going to be a whole lot of you. So let's talk about the three different methods in detail. Method number one, get a remote ID equipped aircraft. And, um, and that remote ID equipped aircraft, let's say that this was one of them, it's going to have the technology inside to send a radio signal. And that radio signal is going to, we call it the message. This is how it's defined in the regulation. And that message is going to be broadcast via Wi-Fi or by using Bluetooth technology. So this is radio frequency technology. And it's going to send that information, and I don't have my cell phone with me, but um, that's going to send that information to a, uh, a wireless device, is what they call it. Think about smartphone. So here's how it's going to work. Here's a, little, um, here's a little animation right here. You have your drone, your drone is going to be flying around, and your drone is broadcasting this message. And by the way, it has to be done from the drone, not from the controller, not from the, 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 the control station. And um, that message is going to be sent to personal devices. So on the ground, you have law enforcement, you have TSA, you have any kind of law enforcement agencies or uh, security agencies, you have the FAA, they're going to be able to pull out their device. Could be a cell phone, could be a device that just captures uh, um, uh, radio frequencies, and then they're going to be able to see the message information on their phone. Okay, As long as they're within range of that device, they're going to be able to do it. Now, the one part that I really hate about this section is the fact that the general public is also going to be able to see the message. Now, there are parts of the message that I'm okay with the general public having access to, but I'm going to talk about it in a second when I talk about the ugly side of remote ID, uh, the fact that they are able to see the location of the pilot. And this is something that uh, I'll talk in more details, but I really don't like that portion. So what's in the message? If you have a remote ID aircraft, here's the message. The UAS ID, so the aircraft ID, which is going to be a serial number, or it's going to be what's called a session ID. I'll talk about session ID in a second. So you're going to have this unique identifier. You know, the FA calls it a license plate in the sky. So think about a random number, serial number, that's going to be displayed. Your name, your phone number, your address uh, is the type of aircraft is not going to be displayed up here in the message. The FAA will have access to that data and they'll be able to cross-reference the data and then figure out who you are. The general public will not. Okay, so I want to make, make sure that's clear. The next part of the message is the latitude and longitude and the altitude and the speed of the unmanned aircraft. That's all going to be in the message. The latitude and longitude and the altitude of the control station meaning you, the pilot, is going to be in the message. An emergency status and a timestamp is going to be in that message. So all five of these things is going to be displayed in the message and sent broadcast by your drone at all time. And it's going to be broadcast every so often. So we'll talk about that. Let's talk about uh, who's going to have access to the remote ID message. So like I said, this is going to be available on personal devices on the ground as long as they're within range of the signal. And 
the database of registration is only going to be available to the FAA and to law enforcement in some cases. So uh, they'll have to request access. Uh, national security personnel is also going to have to request access. And, uh, and the range, by the way, is going to really be based on the type of aircraft that you have. So some aircraft may be able to send that signal a lot further than others. So somewhat, I think this is somewhat of a good news uh, compared to what it was, let's put it that way. Some requirements, some operational requirements that are in the regulation. The broadcast message uh, has to be turned on, has to be functional from takeoff all the way to shut down. I didn't say landing, I said from takeoff all the way to shut down. And there's a reason behind this. The FAA wanted to make sure that uh, when the aircraft goes down, the fact that it landed doesn't mean that it stops broadcasting. Uh, it's going to keep broadcasting until it is actually shut down. Um, it cannot be turned off. You cannot turn off the remote ID requirements. You cannot take off if the broadcast uh, functionality is not working correctly. And if it's not working correctly, um, uh, then you'll get a signal. I'll talk about that in a second. The broadcast message has to be sent directly from the aircraft. It cannot be sent from the control station. So you may be wondering about these things, but that's how it works. Um, one of the issues that I found and that I, that I saw in the preamble that the FAA mentions is the fact that if you're going to be flying indoors, it might be difficult to take off because you may not have a GPS signal. If you don't have a GPS signal, you can't send the latitude and longitude signal uh, to the um, uh, to the uh, to, to in the message, which means that then it's not functional, which means that then you can't take off. Now the FAA says that somebody is going to figure out how to do this, and that they're not too worried. So hopefully we have several years to make this happen. Uh, we'll uh, we'll figure out a way to do it. Some key things that were removed from the NPRM, which is a good thing. Initially, the FAA had two different methods. They had a standard aircraft and then they had a limited remote ID aircraft. A limited is gone. There's no more limited remote ID, which is good. It was too complicated, too confusing. I couldn't see who was going to be using that anyway. Uh, the standard remote ID initially required both network and broadcast. Uh, the FAA basically said no more network. Uh, I'll talk about why in a second. And uh, I can tell you that the telecom companies, I'm sure, are not happy at the moment. They were pushing really hard because they were going to be able to, well, um, sell more services. So here's a quote from the FAA that I really like. I'm going to read it to you. In response to the NPRM, the FAA received significant feedback. Significant feedback. Uh, yeah, 50,000 uh, messages, I would say, is significant feedback about the network requirement indicating both public op opposition to and technical challenges with implementing the network requirement. The FAA had not foreseen or accounted for many of the challenges when it proposed using the network solution and USS framework. The USS was the uh, the the company that was going to receive the signal and then share it with the FAA. After careful consideration of these challenges, informed by public comments, they did listen, the FAA decided to eliminate the requirement in this rulemaking to transmit remote ID messages through an internet connection to a remote ID USS. All right, this is where you cheer. Yes, cheers. I, I don't even have my cup of, <laughs> of uh, water right now, but uh, cheers to you guys. That was that's that's good. The, the, the FA, listen, in all seriousness, this was something that I was really worried about, and uh, and I know a lot of you were, and and it's gone. Now it's gone. I say it's gone, but it's not gone forever. If you read a little bit more in the preamble, um, if you're familiar, you've heard me say this term before. The concept of operation that the FA has put out there. It's called ConOps 2.0 uh, for UTM. UTM is the Unmanned Traffic Management System. There is a concept out there where network has uh, a place. Now, what the FAA says, let's read this. It says, though the NPRM discussed remote identification as a building block for UTM, the FAA has determined that at this time, at this time, this rule will only finalize the broadcast-based remote ID requirement. Basically, what they're saying is step by step. First step, we're just going to do broadcast. Second step, we're going to bring network for I'm guessing more complex operation. Think about beyond visual line of sight operation, that kind of stuff. The FAA has determined that a broadcast-based remote identification system that provides for immediate awareness of unmanned aircraft in the widest variety of settings will be adequate, adequate to support the phase incremental approach 
while allowing the uh, UAS industry additional time to continue developing the network-based UTM ecosystem. Basically what the FAA said is, hey, listen, we want to make sure that we know who's out there flying and uh, we want to be able to, if there is a drone that's flying in a, a restricted area, for example, we want to be able to pull out our, uh, our phone and find out if this is a friendly drone or if it's not a friendly drone. And that's basically what broadcast is going to do. And this is what a lot of us told them um, in, the, in the comments with the NPRM, including myself, where I said, just get rid of the, the network thing because at this stage, it doesn't really do anything for the, the safety part of the regulation. So the FAA has listened. I think, I do believe, and, 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 and I know that this may not be a popular opinion, I do believe there is a place for network capability for remote ID, for complex operation. For the average Joe that's going to be flying their drone around, um, network is plenty is not necessary, okay? And, and this has been proven by Europe. Uh, you have Unifly in Europe that has been doing this. They have two options. They have an option with broadcast only. They have an option with broadcast and network if you're going to do something that's more complex. So anyway, um, I'm getting excited here. Uh, you're going to say, why did they decide to nix the network uh, technology for now? Several reasons. The main ones were a possibility of a DDoS attack. And uh, this was a big one. We actually mentioned that in our comment in the NPRM. Concerns over data protection. Uh, we also mentioned that in there, that uh, we weren't sure that this data was going to be secure enough. And, and the fact that the, uh, the service, service suppliers were going to be able to keep that data uh, secure. So that was a big deal. Uh, the availability of the internet. Uh, the, I think the FAA realized that uh, DC is, is one area of the country, but everywhere else in the country, uh, there's a lot of places where you don't have access to the internet and you're not gonna have access to the internet for uh, several years to come. Uh, and then the last one was having a need for USS, which was gonna increase the cost, which was gonna make it less affordable for people to fly. And the FAA did mention that in the documentation, they did say that this was going to have an additional burden and that they didn't want this to happen. So, uh, so that's gone, and which, is, which is a good thing. So. so all in all, pretty happy camper about that portion. Simplified it a lot, <clears throat> which is exactly what we needed. Okay, that was method number one. Method number two, remote ID module. So dongle, okay, this thing. This is not, this is my focus wheel for my camera. Um, the second method is going to be using a separate device, separate device that you're going to attach to the unmanned aircraft. This is going to be used to retrofit old aircraft or home built, whether a new home built or old home built, you'll be able to put that, slap that on there. There's going to be a serial number attached to it, and then you're going to attach that serial number to your registration so that when the FAA pulls up the, uh, um, the, the registration information for the drone that's flying, that's coming in the message, then they're gonna be able to see that it's a module, they're gonna be able to see who it's, atta it's attached to, and then they'll know who's flying the drone, hopefully. Um, this means that if you're using a remote ID module, you have to keep the aircraft within visual line of sight. Now you're gonna say, does that mean that with the other ones you can go beyond visual line of sight? It means that you could go beyond visual line of sight with a remote ID aircraft, um, it doesn't mean that you're allowed to do it. It means that via regulation and waivers, then you would be able to do it. If you use a module, not going to happen, okay? So if you decide to use a module, you're going to be limited to a visual line of sight and uh, no possibility of beyond visual line of sight. The module is going to use the same technology that we've seen before, which is the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth technology. So um, different information in the message that's coming out of the module. There's going to be a serial number for the module. There's going to be latitude and longitude and altitude and velocity of the aircraft. <clears throat> we've, we've seen that in the previous uh, message. And then there's going to be the latitude, longitude, and the altitude of the takeoff location. Instead of being the location of the pilot with the controller, now it's going to be the takeoff location. Uh, the reason the FAA said that is because they didn't want to... Um, add additional technology. They realized that this is going to be put on aircraft that are not very complex and they didn't have the ability to get the signal from the, the controller into the module. So they basically said, we'll just get takeoff location. Uh, there's not going to be an emergency status message in here. And then <clears throat> uh, there's still going to be a time mark as well included. As I was going through all of this, I realized that a table was in order. 
So I made this little table right here, <clears throat> which is showing you the difference between a standard remote ID aircraft and then a broadcast module. So on the right side, you have the module. So in terms of identification number on the standard remote ID aircraft, you're going to have a serial number or a session ID. I'll talk about session ID in a second. On the broadcast, you're going to have a serial number. So that's the, that's the, the difference. In terms of aircraft information, we're going to have latitude, longitude, altitude, and velocity. All of this is common to both methods. Control station information, well, we have information, latitude, longitude of the alt and the altitude of the control station for the aircraft. And then for the module, it's going to be the takeoff point only. There's no emergency status in the module. And then lastly, there's going to be a time mark for both of them. Okay, so that's kind of <clears throat> simplifying the information right here. A quick note about the session ID. The session ID is going to be this uh, randomized number that's generated uh, at the beginning of each flight. And that's only going to be available if you have an aircraft, not a module. And, uh, and that's going to prevent a UAS from being identified by the general public. If you fly in the same area several times, if a person were to look at that information, they would see a different number each time, a different license plate if you want. It's giving you a different license plate every time you fly. But that number is still going to be available to law enforcement and to the FAA uh, when they do the cross-reference check. Just the public is not going to be able to see it. Uh, this was originally going to be assigned by the USS, the service suppliers in the NPRM. Because there is no more USS, then the FAA is going to work on a solution which is not available at the moment. So. They're still working on it, let's put it this way. In terms of the altitude in the message, what we have is uh, the FA originally they had proposed to use barometric pressure, which was going to mean that you're going to need to have a barometer on board of the aircraft. They scrapped the idea, they said it was going to be too expensive, and uh, instead they're using geometric altitude, which is kind of what drones are using, um, just GPS if you want altitude. So for both the aircraft and the control station, it's going to be geometric altitude instead of a barometric. Um, let's talk about the emergency status. This is one that I kind of scratched my head when I saw it in the NPRM. I didn't really see a need for it. I don't know if I'm still convinced, but uh, this is going to be only required if you have an unmanned aircraft, not if you have a module. The reason is they, there was no way to send information from the module to the aircraft. So the FAA basically said, uh, we're just going to have it on the aircraft. But the, the, the emergency status can be several things. It can say, if there's a lost link, for example, if the aircraft, it says down aircraft, I still don't know what down aircraft means. It means did it crash? Maybe. Uh, if it crashed, then it would be able to send a signal that say, hey, I crashed, I'm right here. Um, if it's a low battery, could be one of the signal in here. Uh, if there was any kind of failure or any kind of abnormal status. So these are not really set in stone. The FA hasn't made a list of all the different uh, status that can be displayed. Uh, one thing that's not going to be in there is if the aircraft is uh, flying and has approval, the FAA decided to go against it and they said nope, even though a lot of people had uh, uh, commented and, and su suggested that this happened. Uh, and then this emergency status can be either done manually by the pilot or it can be done automatically by the UAS in itself. So uh, two different options in here for the emergency status. Uh, the speed, I, th I thought this was interesting, so I think it's worth mentioning. The FAA envisions that the speed is going to be a 3D speed. Not only the, the speed of the aircraft move, moving horizontally, but also moving vertically. So if the airplane, if the aircraft was in a descent, for example, then that would be something that's part of the message. So just thought it would be interesting. The orientation of the aircraft was also one of the, one of the uh, requirement here for, um, for, um, <clears throat> for that part of the message. How often is it going to be updated? The FAA says one message every second, so one piece of data being submitted, so one hertz uh, frequency to send a message. Is it reasonable? I, I, don't, I don't know, actually. Uh, I don't think it's a bad idea. My GPS watch, when I run, records a position every one second, so it's pretty precise doing it this way. Anything longer would have too much latency, I think. Uh, latency in there is also one second, so uh, that message has to be sent and received within one second latency, so um, if you see the information, it should be pretty much, you know, live. Uh, let's talk about this part that I don't like, about the uh, remote ID and PRM. And I call it the ugly side of the, the message. And I've mentioned it before. It's the fact that this is going to be available to the general public 
uh, all of it, all of the message is going to be available to the general public, except the name and the phone number and all and the address and all that. That's only going to be available to the FA. But the location of the control station is going to be available to the FA. And I hate this because the FA obviously get the message from the general public. Because listen to this. It says, though the FA acknowledges the concerns expressed by commenters regarding personal safety, okay, the FA emphasizes that the, there are rules against interfering with an aircraft. The FA finds that removal of the proposed requirement is not the appropriate solution. Rather, community outreach and other precautions are better suited to tackle these issues. Basically, what the FA says is, well, people are not going to harass you because there is rules against it. Well, that's dumb. I'm sorry. Um, I just hate it. I just think this is this is horrible. Community outreach is going to do nothing. The persons that hate drones, you can tell them anything you want. They're still going to hate drone. If they want to find this pilot and if they have a gun, if they have a knife, if they have whatever it is, people are going to get hurt and people are going to get killed. Okay. And, uh, and I hope this doesn't happen. I hope I'm wrong. But uh, this is going to put kids at risk. Okay. Kids that are flying their drones. Um, if you're registering the drone, if you're 13 years old and you can register the drone uh, under your name, then somebody's going to be able to find where a kid is flying. And uh, I'm sorry, but this is not acceptable. So uh, here's another piece that the FAA says. They said they, they argue that encrypting the message would be costly. Basically, what they're saying is that uh, the fact that um, some people may have access to it, some people may not have access to it, can create issues. And, and one of the examples that they give, and that I, I can somewhat understand, but I'll, I'll give an answer in a second. They're saying emergency personnel, okay? You're a, um, you're a firefighter, and, uh, and, and there's a drone flying around, and that's gonna, going to interfere with the operation of the firefighters, and this could cost somebody's life. The FA is basically saying that uh, they wouldn't have access to the encryption, but uh, which means that they wouldn't be able to find where the people are located that are flying the drone, so they can go talk to them to tell them to land so that they can continue their operation. I can see that. I can, I can understand that part of the equation, but there's got to be a way to do this. So um, there, there's got to be a way for people to have access to an app that has the encryption. And maybe there is an, an app just for first responders and people that need to have access to the location but don't need to have access to something else with different levels of, um, of approval, right? I have a website. I can give people access to the website at different level. I can make them an admin. I can make them something. I can make them something else. So uh, why can we do the same thing in this case? So. Um, We've got several years to make this happen. I think the only thing that needs to happen here is that somebody needs to come up with a solution, present it to the FA and said, hey, this is no longer an issue. Take that out of the picture. Uh, and then I think the FA would probably be reasonable and listen. I hope. I, I really hope. Uh, I, I think of all the parts that I've read in here, this is the one that I'm the most disturbed about and uh, that I think is going to cause harm down the road. And, uh, and this is not going to be good. So. Um, all right, I'll stop talking about this. I'm sure you'll have plenty of comments on this section as well. I'll leave them down in the comment section. Uh, I want to talk about losing the broadcast signal in flight because this is something that's likely going to happen. So in here, it says that there's going to be a self-test during the flight, before the flight. It's going to tell you if it's working. During the flight, it's going to tell you if it's working. And if it's not, it's going to send a message to the operator uh, so that um, um, so that the operator can land, I quote, as soon as practicable, okay? As soon as practicable. The FAA says this, the FAA expects the person manipulating the flight controls, this is on page 94 if you want to follow, um, the FAA expects the, the person manipulating the flight controls of the UAS to operate in a manner that minimizes risk to other users of the airspace and people and property on the ground while using aeronautical decision-making to quickly and safely land the unmanned aircraft at a suitable landing area. They're not saying land right away. They're basically saying come back, do it safely, and then land the aircraft. So it's not an emergency, right? It's a, I don't even know if I would call it an urgency. It's something that you have to comply with, but um, it's not something that requires that you land immediately. All right, you guys uh, getting a lot of information? So let's talk about FRIAS, which is method number three. 
A Fryer is an FAA recognized identification area. And uh, if you have an unmanned aircraft that is not equipped with remote ID technology, if you don't have a dongle, if you don't have a, a module on top of it, then you can fly at a Fryer without meeting the requirement, which is cool. Um, who can have a Fryer? A community based organization, a CBO. Uh, primary and secondary educational institutions, trade schools, colleges, universities, all of these can apply to have friars. Here's the key. The aircraft must be flown within the, uh, must be flown within the friar, within the boundaries of the friar, and within visual line of sight. And not only that, but the pilot also has to be inside of the friar. Okay, so there's going to be a boundary. Um, just, I don't know, imagine your flying club and then you gotta fly in there. Uh, something that's changed that's good that I was getting worried about. The idea of fry is not too bad, uh, but basically they're saying that now you can uh, submit applications after a specific amount of time. At first the FAA said, hey, we're only going to allow people to apply for 12 months and after this there's not going to be friars anymore. I think they were afraid that there was going to be too many of them everywhere and that, uh, and that they weren't going to be able to implement remote ID. So instead I think they realized that hey there's a lot of places like uh, the AMA fields that can use these friars and that's going to be beneficial to people that don't have to fly and don't have to equip with remote ID. Uh, so they basically said, hey, you, you can apply anytime you want. Applications are going to start in September of 2022. It is a little while before that happens. Obviously, you know, remote ID is not required until 2023. So uh, September of 2022 is when that's going to happen. And then uh, the FIAs are going to be approved for four years, so 48 months, and then they can be renewed after this. So that's good. That's somewhat of a good news. I'm glad that they changed some of this. Um, little nugget in there, both the pilots and the aircraft have to be within the boundaries of the Fryer, uh, which is something that, uh, that's important to know. And then it also says that because you can't turn off remote ID, if you decide to go fly at a Fryer with a remote ID equipped aircraft, then you're going to continue to broadcast. Uh, the Fryer doesn't mean that you, you, you can broadcast while you're in there. You can still broadcast, uh, but um, you can't turn it off. Okay, let's talk about home builders, uh, not the ones that build houses, right? The one that build drones at home. Uh, the, uh, I know this was a big area of concern. I know there's a, there's a whole community that's still not really happy about this, but uh, I think they should be a lot happier than they were when the NPRM came out. But um, in the NPRM, at first the FAA had required that each person that builds their drones at home would have to comply with the regulation, which means that they would have to send that, uh, those means of compliance documents to the FAA, which, is, which was just dumb, okay? Uh, this would have taken thousands of dollars, maybe even tens of thousands of dollars, and uh, that would have just not worked. So instead, the FAA came back and they said, hey, um, we're going to let people uh, either put a module, so you got three ways that you can comply if you home build your own, hair, your own aircraft. You can put a module on it to comply. You can apply for it yourself if you want to. You could still do that. So you could create your own remote ID uh, technology, go through the means of compliance, send it to the FAA, get it approved, and then you're good. Or you can use somebody else's uh, means of compliance. And this is somewhat important. What I'm foreseeing is going to happen here, and I may be wrong because this is still kind of a concept, but somebody out there that wants to make a buck is going to go and create a remote ID compliant device. And then they're going to allow people to build their own based on plans, whatever it is. And then this, these people that created this thing initially, they're going to apply to the FA and said, here's the means of compliance and for this device. And then they're going to say, here, you can buy it from us, you can give it for free. I'm thinking of, of uh, places that uh, of 501c3 uh, um, organizations can probably go through this process, submit the paperwork, kind of absorbs the cost, and then give it to their uh, members and basically say, use this for means of compliance, and you can use our mean of compliance to build this device and then equip it on your, 
on your aircraft. So uh, again, this is just my kind of my guess based on, on what I read. Uh, I know people are going to be creative, but this is good. This is an option for people to do this. So three different ways to comply as a home builder. I, personally, I think one of the easiest thing is going to be to just buy one of the modules and put it on there. I can see these modules being very expensive. And then there's some options where you can uh, actually use the modules in different places. So we'll talk about that. Um, in terms of kits, now home built is one thing, kits are different. Kits is going to be, the FA looks at a kit as a deconstructed unmanned aircraft. So if you buy a kit and it's labeled as a kit, then the kit manufacturer is going to have to comply with remote ID means of compliance. So they're going to have to submit the paperwork to the FA just like a manufacturer would and then they're going to put all this into a box and then they're going to send it to you and then you're going to put the kit together and then you're going to comply. Okay, so that's kind of where we are. Um, labeling requirement. There, there is a label requirement. If you have a drone that is that meets the requirement or if you have a module that meets the requirement of remote ID, there's going to be a label displayed on that device. And then if you have a drone that's going to be retrofitted by software. Now, this is something I haven't even talked about yet, but this little thing, well, the bigger one. Let's say that uh, um, I, I, it's somewhere in there. My um, Mavic Air 2, my, my Mavic Air 2, Mavic 2 Pro, um, more than likely is going to be compliant by software because DJI has the technology on board of these drones already. This one probably as well. And they're going to be able to send the signal without too much of a difficulty. In this case, DJI is going to come up with a label. They're either going to mail it to you or they're probably going to have it available online so you can print it and then you'll be able to slap it on this device and then it's compliant, okay? So you need to have a label. That's the bottom line. Let's talk about registration because... Uh, <sighs> I tried, I tried to make examples and hopefully I'm not going to confuse you too much. Um, it, it becomes complicated because, um, well, just because of the way it's written in the regulation. So I'm going to try to simplify it. There's no changes to the way registration is going to have to be done. If you're flying under the limited recreational exception, so if you're flying for fun, for recreational purposes, if your drone is over 250 grams, if it's less than 55 pounds, then it has to be registered. One registration per person, and then you can slap that registration number on all of your UAS that are flown for fun, okay? If you are flying under Part 107, no changes either. Each of the drones that are operated that are under 55 pounds have to be registered. They're going to have a special registration number and then you slap that on the device. So that's, that's no different. Now, what's a little bit different now is that you're going to have to provide the FAA with, um, with serial numbers uh, and, um, and serial numbers of a, a module of an aircraft is going to have to go in there. So <clears throat> if you're going as a recreational flyer, all right, then you're going to get what's called a certificate of aircraft registration. It's a registration card, whatever you want to call it. They, it's kind of a new name. It's a, I always call it registration certificate because that's what we call it in manned aviation. But certificate of aircraft registration. And then on that aircraft, on that certificate of aircraft registration, in the FAA drone zone, you're going to tell the FAA all of the remote ID aircraft that you have, all of the modules that you have, and then all of the aircraft that you have that uh, need to be registered but don't comply with remote ID. And so you're going to put all of these things in there and then when one of these numbers pops up, then the FAA is going to be able to cross-reference it to you as the pilot. $5 per person, good for three years, no change there. And then there, there's no indication really that you're going to have to pay extra to add those serials, serial numbers as long as your registration is valid. I have a valid registration still from um, for uh, recreational flying, so I could go in there and add those um, those uh, numbers without any additional cost, okay? I hope this is clear. You can use one, and this is kind of important, and it's kind of buried in there. You can use one remote ID module for several aircraft if you're flying as a recreational flyer, okay? This little dongle, I can put it on my Mavic Air 2. I can put it on my, well, no, not really, because it doesn't need to be registered. So bad example. I can put it on my Mavic Air 2. Uh, yeah, my Mavic Air 2, I can put it on my, um, Mavic 2 Pro, I can put it on my Inspire. If I'm flying all of these for recreational purposes, I can keep switching the module from device to device and, uh, and, and be fine, okay? So that's not a problem. If you're flying under Part 107, things are a little bit different because now you have a serial number, a remote ID serial number for your remote ID aircraft 
or for your module and it can only be associated with one certificate of registration, okay? I have an Inspire 2, I have a Mavic Air 2, I have a, a Mavic 2 Pro. All of these are going to have each a certificate of registration and each of these is going to have a remote ID serial number. Whether it's a remote ID serial number because it's already an aircraft that's approved to be remote ID or it's going to have a module attached to it that's going to be attached to that specific aircraft. So, um, so that's how it works, all right? So, but, 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 if you uh, have a module, it can only be associated with one aircraft and one certificate of registration. So if I have three drones that need to have a module and I'm operating all three of these drones under part 107, I have to get a module for each of them. Or I can take the module off, deregister the aircraft, go back in the drone zone, re-register the aircraft, pay $5 again. So you'd have to pay $5 every time you take a, uh, a module out and put it on the new one. So you'd have to get three different modules in this case. Not the best, but <clears throat> something that was kind of expected because of the way things are done. Um, if you buy a drone, this is kind of uh, something to think about. If you buy a drone, a remote ID drone from someone in the future, or if you buy a remote ID module from someone in the future, you're going to have to make sure that they deregister that drone or that module before you can register it. Otherwise, you won't be able to because the FAA is not going to allow for dupli duplicates in the system. And I don't know why, but I'm starting to lose my voice. <laughs> uh, I woke up a little scruffy this morning and then <clears throat> uh, I hope I'll be able to finish. Here's an example, and hopefully this doesn't get you confused, but I'm going to put it here in the background so you can see it. Bob has five UAS and he has one remote ID module and he operates under uh, 48, 44809, which is for recreational purposes only. He has a Mavic Mini 2. He has a fixed wing UAS that's uh, 570 grams. It's three years old, doesn't have a serial number. He has a DJI Inspire 2 that was converted to standard remote ID. By the way, I don't know if the, the Inspire 2 is gonna be able to be uh, retrofitted, but I'm just assuming here. <coughs> he has a Hotel Evo 4. You haven't heard about the Hotel Evo 4 yet? It's got really cool specs. It does uh, 12K and, uh, and uh, 150 frames per second. <laughs> it was built in 2023. It qualifies as a standard remote ID drone and uh, it has a serial number, ABC456, whatever. Uh, he has a home-built fixed-wing aircraft over 250 grams and that has no serial number. And then he has a remote ID module that he's going to be using uh, to put on these older aircraft. And that has a serial number as well. Okay, so that's the example here. So what, what happens here, really? Um, since Bob is flying under 44809, he gets a single certificate of registration. He pays $5, it's good for three years. And then on that certificate of registration, he's going to put the following. Now, he's not going to put the Mavic Mini 2 because that doesn't need to be registered. So that's out of the picture. He's going to put the make and model of that three-year-old uh, drone that he has, 570 uh, gram. There's no serial number, so he's not going to put a serial number. And then he can fly that at a fryer without any issues, or he can fly it using the remote ID module that he has, that he has also put on that certificate of registration. He has a home built. <clears throat> he has another home built that doesn't have a serial number. So he's going to put that on there, put it as a home built. And he can fly that as a, um, at a fryer without anything on it, or he can put the remote ID module on top of it and then fly it outside of a fryer. So that's an example here. The DJI, the DJI Inspire 2 is going to put the make and model in there. Um, it probably doesn't have a serial number that meets the requirement, but it does have a serial number. So I'm not sure here what would actually happen, but my guess would be that you put the serial number in there anyway. And then uh, it's compliant with remote ID via software. So I don't know if that would issue a new remote ID uh, when, you, when they issued a new software. I'm not sure because there are requirements for remote ID um, serial numbers. So that's the part that I'm not clear on just yet. So, but I'm pretty sure they would have via software update to, to issue a new serial ID for that specific drone. And then you could fly that outside of a fryer without any problem because it would be compliant with remote ID, but it would be listed under his certificate of registration. And then the Hotel Evo 4, very simple. You would just put the serial number in there and then it's good to go. 
and then that RID module, same thing. You would just put the remote ID uh, uh, serial number on that certificate of registration, and then he's basically good to go. So that's example number one. Example number two, Jessica, she's got three drones and a remote ID module. So three drones plus a module, and then they're all operated under part 107. So the, um, he has a, she has a Phantom 3, which ca cannot be retrofitted via software. So this is too old. Uh, she has a fixed wing mapping drone that's over 250 gram, no serial number, unlikely to be retrofitted either. And then she has the brand new DJI Mavic Cloud 5. You haven't about, you, I'm sure you haven't heard about the Cloud 5. This is the first time, so make sure you spread the word. Um, it's going to be manufactured in 2023, and it's full RID compliant. So that's pretty awesome. Um, so in this case, what does she have for option? She'll have to choose whether she puts that remote ID module on either the Phantom 3 or on the fixed wing mapping drone, but she can't switch them without having to pay five bucks every single time. So that's kind of the bottom line. All right, we're almost done with remote ID, I promise. If you want to take a break, take a break. Just click pause and go to the next one. Um, how about early compliance? There, there's been some questions about early compliance. You will be able to start complying with the new regulation as early as March 2021-ish around that time, okay? That's still TBD uh, based on when the FA is going to publish that regulation, but my guess is March, probably March, latest April of 2021. Now, the FA has said that early compliance could, could help with the waiver application, but it's not guaranteed. So if you comply early, you could have access to things that um, it would make it easier to get, um, to get some waivers. Um, th there was a question in there about uh, providing incentives uh, like ADSB. So when the FAA re required uh, the man aircraft community to install ADSB modules, which were pretty expensive, uh, the FAA came up with incentives. Uh, so somebody asked, hey, what about incentives to comply with remote ID? And the FAA said that they would actually review comments or different incentive methods uh, f to help people comply with remote ID. So that's good. That's good to hear. Uh, there's also more to come. The FAA is working on an advisory circular uh, for helping with the means of compliance. Advisory circulars are documents issued by the FAA that clarify things usually. Uh, there is one right now called AC 107-2 uh, that's for small and, and aircraft system and they will update that advisory circular. Um, and um, yeah, that's it. Okay, some questions. I know there'll be a ton more questions, but some that I could think from the top of my head that are gonna be probably uh, pretty common. Will my new drone be compatible? Um, I can't speak for all the drone manufacturers, but my guess, is the drones that were manufactured in the last couple of years are going to be retrofitted um, to remote ID without too much of an issue. If you have a drone from DJI, from Hotel, from other big manufacturers, you won't have an issue, okay? It's gonna be a software update is my guess, and then you'll be good to go. And the reason I'm saying this, by the way, is because um, this transmits information on radio frequency, okay? Uh, 2.4 gigahertz, 5.8 gigahertz, uh, that's, uh, that's what is being used. So it's available, it's right there. Now you just need to figure out how to do the broadcast thing without having to add another device. So, and even if it's not, you'll be able to get a module and put it on top. So yes, your new drone that you just bought for Christmas is probably gonna be just fine. Will you be able to install the remote ID module yourself? Yes, uh, the answer, if you look on page 87, there's some information there. The FAA says that you'll just have to follow the instructions provided by the module manufacturer. So that's good news. Um, the other question, is this gonna be on the exam? I feel like I'm with my students at the, at the, at the college right now. Uh, yes, it's gonna be on the exam eventually. Uh, not sure how much of this is gonna be on the exam. Uh, there's going to be stuff for sure, like the night stuff that I'm going to talk about in a minute, flying over people. Night stuff is going to be on the exam very quickly. Uh, the remote ID stuff will be on the exam in the future. We've got plenty of time to put it in there. Uh, before anything goes onto the exam, the FAA updates the Airman Certification Standard, the ACS. When I make a course, any FAA course that I teach, I go to the Airman Certification Standards, I look at what the FAA wants you to know about, and then I create a course. So uh, at this moment, there's no update for the Airman Certification Standards, although there is an update in Part 107 that says that uh, now I need to teach you about night stuff. 
Good news is I've been teaching about night stuff for 20 years to man aircraft pilots, so we have all the information available. We just need to uh, make a nice little video and then put it in the course. So that's going to be coming up very soon uh, to a course near you. Okay. That's it for Remote ID. Uh, that's a ton of information, but you know what? Bottom line, it's actually pretty straightforward. Buy a drone that's compatible with Remote ID starting in 2022, sometimes in the middle of 2022, or have an old drone, slap on a device on top of it. You can comply with it if you don't want to buy a device. If you're just flying at an AMA type of airfield, then just go fly out of Fryer, and then you don't need to, uh, to comply with Remote ID and life is good. So I know, I know it's not going to work for everyone, but I think this was a good consensus. I'm actually pretty pleased, very surprised that the FAA went through all this. I remember writing my comment and saying, um, just get rid of the USS, just get rid of the network thing, thinking, hey, why not? The worst they can say is no, right? And uh, thinking that it was never going to happen, and it did. So, uh, so miracles do come true. All right, let's talk about the next topic, which is flying over people, flying over moving vehicles. Now, I'm going to say this. Uh, this is probably the most, flying over people, the most complex piece of the puzzle. And I don't know it's because I got into it after having spent a day and a half reading about remote ID, but man, I had to read through this several times and, um, and, and it could have made it easier. Um, so I'm going to do my best to make it simple for you, but, but it's complex. Okay. And because it's complex, uh, there is a possibility that I may say something that's incorrect. Now it's going to be minor. I'm sure, uh, I'll, I'll be, putting uh, uh, updates in the comments if I do something, say something stupid, uh, but please don't hold it against me. I'm still learning as well. There's just, it's just complex and there's just a ton of information in there. So um, changes to regulation, just a quick overview of what is going on. No, you can fly over people anytime you want. There are still some limitations. This is not a free for all, okay? No, the Mavic Mini alone does not allow you to fly over people. So just because you get a Mavic Mini and you read somewhere on uh, some website that now you can fly over people or you can fly at night, it's not the case, okay? There are some stipulations, there are some ifs that you have to follow and that's what I'm going to teach you right here. Yes, this is only for part 107. If you are flying under uh, section 44809, which is recreational flyers, nothing has changed there. You still can fly over people. You can fly at night. I'll talk about that uh, with some limitations. But no, you can't fly over people willy-nilly uh, just because, well, just because you read it somewhere in an article. Okay, so flying over people. There is, I'm going to divide this into two things, flying over people, flying over moving vehicles, which is a different set of regulation. There's four different categories that are going to be applied to drones. A drone has to fly, has to fall under one of these four categories in order to be able to qualify to fly over people. And even then, there are some restrictions as to the type of flying over people that you're doing. So I'll get to that. So category one, two, three, or four. Simple, okay? So that's what we're going to do. Let's take a look at this diagram. And, and I thought doing a table was the easiest way to compare all four of them because as I was writing the slides, I kept looking at different things and I was like, well, what was it for category one? What was it for category two? So I, I have three pages here of tables where I'm going to compare different things. Category one. Category one is the easiest. This, there's a weight limit of 0.55 pounds, 250 grams. So the little mini right here falls under category one, possibly with some exceptions. Um, it says in here, no exposed rotating parts that can cause laceration. And there's a yes. So basically you have to, or the manufacturer of this drone is going to have to prove to the FAA that this is not going to have exposed parts that can cause laceration. I'm going to get back to this in a minute because there is some well, there's some intricacies in here. Um, there's, is there a requirement for no safety defect? No, there's no requirement in here. You'll see why, because there is a requirement for the other categories. Is there an injury limit? There's no injury limit. So they basically, the FAA said, hey, these things are so small that uh, we know if they eventually hit someone, it's probably not going to kill them. And, uh, and there is no real injury limit that needs to be proven. Okay, that's the easiest way of saying this. For category two aircraft, 
anything under 55 pounds is going to fall under category 2. And again, there's a requirement that there's no laceration possible from rotating parts. Um, there's another requirement that there's no safety defect. So I'll talk about this a little bit, not so much about the safety defect because this it's kind of just a, a bunch of words uh, in there that are just confusing, but uh, there's an injury limit and, and here's how it's measured. It's measured in foot pounds of kinetic energy. Basically said that this object when it falls, it cannot create more than 11 foot pounds of kinetic energy. What is kinetic energy? It's energy, okay? Energy is, 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 uh, is power, okay? And uh, so they're basically looking at how powerful of an impact if this drone falls from the sky, it's going to create on a human. And, and there's a reason behind this 11 foot-pounds. This is not something the FAA found. There are some standards out there. So the drone manufacturers are going to have to prove that if this drone falls on someone, uh, then it's not going to have this kind of injury level. Okay? I hope this is not too confusing. In category 3, we have pretty much the same requirements, except the... Uh, injury requirement or the injury limit has been upped, which means that now the drone can create more damage. This is going to lead to more restrictions. This is I'm going to talk about the restrictions in a minute, but the fact that you can have more possible injuries, the FAA is saying, well, if this is going to happen, then we're going to have to have some ifs. There's going to be some restrictions. And the last one is we have category four. Category four is if the aircraft has an airworthiness certificate approved under part 21. Um, think about drones that do drone deliveries, okay? I want you to think about category four as the drone delivery kind of thing. Uh, it's in there because they have an airworthiness certificate, which means that the aircraft has been reviewed by the FAA. They have to have a maintenance system, preventative maintenance in place. They have to have a, a system for alterations and repairs and inspections. So it's a lot more involved. It's almost like a manned aircraft at this stage. It follows kind of the same regulation as manned aircraft do. So it's going to have a special category. I'm not going to go in detail about category four because the 99.9% the .9 of you that are watching this are not going to care about that part. Okay, let's talk about, uh, well, several other things. There's this term called means of compliance and declarations of compliance, which is going to be, think about it as paperwork, okay? Paperwork that the manufacturer is going to have to submit to the FAA to get all of this approved. If you fall, if your drone falls in category one, there's no real crazy paperwork to be submitted to the FAA. I'll talk more about means of compliance and declaration of compliance uh, in a minute to give you more detail about what it means, but that's uh, just picture it this way. Um, there's no label requirements for category one, and then there's no real additional uh, limitations in this case. So category one, they kept it pretty simple. Um, I'll talk about some, some limitations, but none like what we see in category two and category three. Um, category two is going to require uh, MOC and DOC, means of compliance and, and declaration of compliance, and it's going to require a label. So if you buy a drone that is approved under category two, then it's going to basically have a label that says this is approved to fly under category two. In plain English, it says in the regulation. Uh, no real additional limitations other than the ones I'm going to mention in a minute. Uh, category three, same thing. You need to have a label that says category three, and then uh, there's some Pretty big limitations. I'm going to explain them in the next slide because, uh, well, because they didn't fit in that little rectangle right here. And then in category four aircraft, you need to have part 21 airworthiness certificate. It's going to be labeled as category four. And then the limitations are going to be all tied to the airworthiness certificate. Like I said, don't worry too much about category four. Okay, let's talk about these limitations here. A category one aircraft. Where can you fly over people? Because there are some limitations as to where you can fly. And for category one, they have to meet the requirements below. And it's, it gets confusing. And see, this is, this is where it gets confusing. And I hope you don't get confused. I hope this table kind of makes sense here. But you can basically fly over people anywhere you want as long as the, the requirements underneath are met. Um, can you fly over people without remote ID for now? Yes, as long as you're not flying um, over open air assembly. Think about large groups of people. So if you're gonna hover, I'm gonna put it this way. If you're gonna hover this aircraft over a, this is category one. If you're gonna hover this aircraft over a large assembly of people, let's say a political rally, let's say a concert, 
okay, then you need to meet the requirement for remote ID as well. If you do it for part 107, because this is part 107 regulation, then it means that you need to have a remote ID system attached to this thing, which means that you won't be able to do that for a while, okay? So that's the only exception if you want. You can fly this anywhere over people, but if you're gonna do it over an open air assembly, which means large amount of people, and if you're gonna be sustained, if you're gonna stay on top of them like this, then you need to have remote ID. Um, can you do sustained flight over open air assembly? Yes, if you meet the remote ID requirement, okay? Category two. Can you fly anywhere? Yes, the same thing that we had, as long as you meet a few requirements. Can you fly over open air uh, assembly for sustained flight only if you have remote ID requirements? Can you fly just quickly over these areas? Yes, you can. You just can't do sustained flight over open air assembly. Can you fly over just one person that is on their, well, I'm not gonna say on their bicycle. Somebody who's running, can you fly on top of them for a split second, just like this? Yes, you can, okay? Because it's not an open air assembly. So, they couldn't make it simple. <laughs> Category, I have some examples, by the way, that are coming up. If you have a specific scenario, put it down in the comments. I'll try to make sense of it and see uh, if we can find it from the regulation. But this is as easy as I could figure out to make it. Um, Category three, this is when it becomes complicated. You cannot fly anywhere you want. You have to fly over a closed or restricted site and you have to meet the other requirements as well. Can you fly over people without remote ID for now? Yes, with some limitations that I'm going to discuss in the next slide. Can you do sustained flight over open air assembly? No, you can't. Not with a Category 3 aircraft. Because remember, Category 3 aircraft, if it falls, it can create a lot more damage. So basically what they're saying is, hey, you can fly this drone, it's going to do more damage, but you only do it in a restricted area, in a closed site, and, uh, and, and with the general public not having access to it. That's basically what they're saying. If there's a concert, if there's a, a political rally, whatever it is, you can fly this drone on top of it. All right? Let's think about this. Category 3 limitation, so a little bit more in detail here. 107.25 is the regulation. It says operation must be within or over a closed or restricted site, and all humans are on notice that a drone might fly over them. I'm going to let that sink in for a second. You must be in a restricted area, and all humans must be on notice that the drone is going to fly over them. That's if you fly with a Category 3 drone, which means that it can do more damage. You also cannot fly sustained flight, which means that you're just hovering on top of them over a human being unless they are directly participating, which is something that we had in the regulation before, or they are over a, uh, under a covered structure or inside of a stationary vehicle, which is the same regulation that we had before, okay? You could fly over uh, people if they were hiding behind or underneath the roof, or if they were inside of a car that wasn't moving. So that's no different than what we had before. Okay, I know, I know it's a lot of information. Uh, it's gonna take a while to, to digest. Now, I wanted to have definitions because, because I know you guys are going to ask, what is sustained flight? Sustained flight includes what? Hovering above the heads of people that are gathered, flying back and forth over a large group of people, for example, circling, okay, in the way that the small and aircraft remains above some part of the assembly. All that is all on page six, if you want to read it. It says, sustained flight does not include a brief one-time uh, transiting over a portion of the assembled gathering where the transit is merely incidental to a point-to-point -point operation. They're basically saying, hey, if you have to go from point A to point B to get somewhere, you can basically fly on top of them because you're not going to be just hovering and you're not going to be staying there. So it means that the likelihood of this drone, category one or category two, getting in trouble and then losing flight and falling on people is very little so you can basically do that if you're transiting. Now, if you're hovering over people, now you're increasing the chances that the drone is going to fail and then of hurting someone for category one and two, okay? 
And that's, that's the reasoning behind if you want to try to find a way to remember all this. The FAA doesn't want you to do sustained flight if you're flying a drone that's going to be creating a lot of damage, category 3. If you're flying a drone that's not going to do a lot of damage, category 1 or category 2, then they're saying it's okay to hover uh, on top of people um, without an issue. That's, that's the way I understand it. What is an open air assembly? And I hate this. I hate this section. This is on page 128 if you want to read with me. Uh, there's no specific definition of an open air assembly. It's not based on the density of people. Instead, here's what the FAA says. It says the FAA has declined to define this term by regulation. Rather, the FAA employs a case by case approach in determining how to apply the term open air assembly. This is the same shenanigans that the FAA has been doing for years and years and years to talk about um, congested areas and, and other things. They basically don't want to define these terms and they're just going to do it on the open, on the case by case basis. So, uh, you know, remember when we talked about in the regulation, uh, when we talked about other than congested areas, uh, this is the same thing here. Um, so here's another quote. Whether an operational area is an open air assembly is evaluated by considering the density of people who are not directly participating in the operation of the small and man aircraft and the size of the operational area. Such assemblies are usually associated with public spaces. So here's an example. The FAA considers some examples. They say sporting events, concerts, parades, protests, political rallies, community festivals, parks and beaches during certain events. All of these are going to be considered um, open air assemblies. It says some potential examples that are likely to be less likely to be considered open air assembly include individual person or families exiting a shopping center. I don't know why they put that example in here. Nobody goes to shopping centers anymore. Uh, athletes participating in friendly sports in an open area without spectators, individuals or small groups taking leisure in a park or on a beach, and individuals walking or riding a bike along a bike path. So that's not considered open air assembly, which means that it doesn't require remote ID. That's the bottom line. They basically said, hey, if you're going to be flying over a large amount of people, you need to have remote ID. If you are not going to be flying over a large amount of people, then you can do all these things as long as you have a category one, two uh, aircraft without any issues. That's the bottom line. Okay. Whew. They could have just said that. That would have made it a lot easier. Uh, Means of compliance. So two terms that I want to define. Means of compliance, declar declaration of compliance. Means of compliance, how is the applicant going to prove their UAS meets the requirement, including the kinetic energy impact and all of that? This is basically going to be done via test, analysis, inspections that will be sent to the FAA for review and approval. So that's their means of compliance. Not something that you have to worry about unless you're a, uh, a UAS manufacturer or designer. The declaration of compliance is basically going to be telling the FAA which make and model and series of aircraft are compliant along with a range of serial number. So the FAA is going to come up with the uh, DJI Mavic 5 and then they're going to say, tell the FAA, this is how we tested the Mavic 5 using means of compliance. And then they're going to say, here's our declaration of compliance. All Mavic 5 that have this serial number to this serial number are good to go. And by the way, this is no different than what the FAA has been doing with uh, aircraft manufacturers, many aircraft manufacturers, same kind of idea. I want to talk about moving parts. Moving parts because, um, um, well, because it's important. That there, that there is some regulations in there that says that there cannot be any moving parts that are going to create lacerations. And, uh, and there's different methods of doing this. You can think of prop guards. I have my prop guard somewhere for this little device right here. Uh, you can put prop guards on top of it and then it's going to prevent laceration. The problem with the prop guards is that they're heavy and they take the drone over a certain weight. The Mini 2, for example, it's 242 grams without the prop guards. It's 289 grams with them. So then it takes it out of category one, puts it in category two, and then, well, and then it doesn't work anymore. Um, Another method is that the FAA mentions in there is the automatic motor stop. The idea is in an emergency, the motors would stop completely and then the props can't create lacerations. So that's something to think about. Um, so that was flying over people. An additional layer is flying over moving vehicles. The FAA has 
um, said that if you have a category one, two, or three aircraft that meets all those requirements that I just mentioned, then you can fly over moving vehicles if you meet these requirements. So you need to have a category one, two, or three, and you must remain within or over a closed restricted access site and everyone in the moving vehicle inside must be on notice. So that's one option. Or the UAS must not maintain sustained flight over the moving vehicle. So I have some examples that I want to share, but I'm going to let that sink in for example, for, for the moment. You basically can fly over a moving vehicle if you are in a private area, in a closed site, and everybody is on notice, okay? Or you can fly over them if you just want to cross quickly and you're not doing sustained flight. Remember the definition of sustained flight. So what's a vehicle? First, let's talk about what's a vehicle. The FAA says anything that uh, is a mean of transportation, regardless if it has a motor on it or not, a car, a truck, a bus, a train, motorcycle, scooters, roller, coaster, roller coasters, or all vehicles. A bicycle is also a vehicle. A watercraft, okay, sightseeing vessel, motorboats, a personal watercraft, all of these are all vehicles in the eyes of this regulation. So here's an example. You fly over your friend on his or her motorcycle on a racetrack. You're directly flying on top of him the entire time. That's legal if the site is a restricted area, okay, where not everyone can go, and if everyone is on notice, then it's not a problem. You need to, another example, you need to cross a highway for a shot. And this happens a lot. People ask this a lot. What if I'm just flying real quick on top of the highway and uh, I'm only going to be there for a split second? It is legal as long as there is no sustained flight, okay? So only if you're doing transit, then technically it is legal in this case. If you're recording a video by flying directly over the uh, sightseeing boat that you just notice in the distance, you see this boat, you go, oh, that's pretty cool. I'm just going to fly on top of them, right on top of them and cruise along with them. That's not legal because you have not provided notice to the participants that are in the vehicle. Okay, that's, that's, that's my examples. I'm sticking to it. Okay, uh, how about flying over people as a recreational pilot? Not going to happen. This regulation I just talked about is only Part 107 regulation. No changes in 48809. You still can fly over people out there until there is changes in regulation. So forget about it. Let's talk about a realistic timeline. Um, because category one doesn't require method of compliance or, or the DOC, then it is possible that it could be used as early as March 2021. But if you're gonna be flying over open air assembly, it's gonna be later because now you need to have remote ID. But to fly over people without being an open air assembly, then technically it could be done as early as March 2021, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, category 2 and Category 3 are going to require MOC and DOC, which means that it's going to take a while for that to happen uh, from the time of the, uh, the publication date. So I wouldn't count on that for too long. Category 4 technically could happen pretty quickly because it's all tied to uh, Part 21. Okay, last topic, flying at night and recurrent training. Flying at night is now possible and easier without a waiver. Yes, you will need to get additional training. Yes, you will still have to wait a little bit, a few months at least, from the time this is posted. No, you still can't take the initial exam online. That's no different, okay? And yes, you can take the initial, uh, the recurrent training online with the FAA, and then you can skip the $160 recurrent exam. So I know this is something that you guys have been waiting for, and, uh, and it's good news. It's somewhat good news. So flying at night without a waiver. In order to fly at night without a waiver, you need to complete prior to the operation, either an updated initial test or the updated recurrent online training that the FA is going to provide. So that's really all that needs to have, well, and you also need to have the anti-collision light, which we had before. So that's really the only thing. So as soon as the, uh, the training is available and, uh, and uh, all these months I've gone through, you can take the training online, or if you're taking an initial test because you don't have a part 107 just yet, and, uh, and then you do it after a specific uh, period of time, then you'll be able to fly at night as long as you have anti-collision light. So that's pretty cool. I, I, I really like that portion of it. Uh, but you need, to do, you need to get training. In terms of recurrent training, there's no more need to pass the recurrent exam every 24 calendar months. So that's going to save you 160 bucks. Instead, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to complete the free training that's on the FAA website, uh, which includes night training, 
and then uh, that's, they're going to be required for night flying, and then that's it, and you're basically good to go. Let's take a look at this timeline right here, because I think this is important. Um, it starts with January, February, March, and April of, this is 2021. There's going to be a publication date at one point for this regulation. My guess is somewhere in the middle of January right here, but it's, it's still TBD. From here, a clock starts, 45 days. 45 days later, the night training is going to be available on the FAA website, and the night material is going to be on the FAA initial exam. So this takes us to somewhere possibly um, in the beginning of March of 2021. So here what happens, the night training becomes available on the FAA website. But wait, this is not it. If you are a 107.29 holder, then you can fly, which means that you have a, a, a daylight waiver, you can fly at night. Then you can fly at night as soon as you take the training, right away you can start to fly at night without really having that waiver. Although you could still continue to fly at night because, uh, because you have a waiver. Now that waiver is going to eventually expire, but we'll talk about that. Now, starting from that time, okay, from the time that the training becomes available on the FAA website, there's a 15-day training period where it's a hold period as well, where people that don't have a waiver can get trained. Don't go on the first day that it's available, don't go take the training just yet, okay, because you're going to overload the server at the FAA and then everything is going to crash and nobody's going to be able to do training. So just wait, you have 15 days. It doesn't matter because you can't start to operate anyway until the end of the, the end of that cooling period, okay, of that testing period of 15 days. So then 15 days after this, you can start to fly. If you don't have a waiver, you can start to fly at night as long as you did the training. So realistically, if you don't have a waiver at the moment, you will be able to fly at night sometime in the middle to the end of March of 2021. By tr but you have to take the training first and you have to have those flashing lights on your drone first, okay? So get the training, you have 15 days to do it. You can't start flying anyway, even if you do the training. If the day that the training comes out, if you don't have a waiver at the moment, if the day that the training comes out, if you take that training, you're still gonna have to wait 15 days, okay? So don't rush to do the training. Just do it sometime during that 15 day period and then you'll be good to go. And this is a question that's already come up from someone, from one of my students. Uh, no, you do not need to comply with remote ID in order to fly at night. Two different regulation, completely irrelevant. Now you will in 2023 when remote ID becomes uh, re required, but at the moment you can fly at night without a waiver as long as you meet all the requirements I just said, no need for remote ID. Uh, in terms of waiver, if you have a waiver that was issued prior to the publication date, uh, what's gonna happen is it's gonna expire 120 days after publication date. So if you have a waiver, I have a night waiver, that night waiver is gonna be valid basically until May-ish of 2021. After that, you'll have to do the training online and then you'll have to uh, follow the new procedure. But until then, the FAA basically gave uh, people that have a waiver a little bit of time uh, to, uh, to apply for that training and do the training. So that's kind of a good news. Uh, where's the training going to be? You may be asking about the training. It's going to be on the FAA website under faasafety.gov. Here's what I want you to do. At the end of this video, go to faasafety.gov, create an account today, and become familiar with the website. Um, it's, uh, it's a great place to get recurrent training. I've been using it for, for almost 20 years now because that's where the FAA has all the training for uh, many aircraft pilots. And it's a great place. Tons of really good information in there. You should have an account already anyway. Uh, but uh, uh, once the training becomes available, it's going to be in there. Uh, the training is not available yet. So if you do a search for UAS, you're going to find certain things in there. You're going to find some training modules. One of them is recurrent training for, uh, for manned aircraft pilots. This is not the training that you want to do. Okay. So if you go in there between now and March and you see some training, recurrent training, this is not it. This is, don't take it. Don't, well, I mean, you can do it if you want, but it's pointless. And by the way, the reason I'm saying don't go on the FAA website the day that the training comes out is because there's over 200,000 remote pilots at the moment. If all 200,000 of them go on the website and start to do the training, it's going to crash. I know the website is going to crash anyway on that day, but uh, try to prevent going in there to do the training. It's not going to happen. Um, if you're one of my students in the Part 107 course, you will be getting the night training for free through our course before it becomes available on the FAA website. Uh, it will cover everything that the FAA is going to cover and some more. 
but it won't count as official training. So our recurrent training does not count as official FA training. Nobody will. So if somebody else is telling you that it does, that their training is uh, valid, it's not. You have to do the official FA training. But we'll give you, just like what we do all the time, we'll give you more information than, uh, than the FA. Okay. One more slide, and then I'll let you guys go, wrap it up. Uh, we've I've been talking for a while now. Uh, hopefully you stayed with me because I know this is important information, but uh, there's been a change in the FA. Uh, this is who you need to present your remote pilot certificate and your ID uh, when inspection. So <clears throat> in the past, it was only the FA. Now it's the FA, the NTSB, any uh, federal, state, and local enforcement uh, law enforcement officers can have access to your, uh, your remote pilot certificate and your ID if they're asked. Uh, you must make it available, now to the FA only, you need to make available any documents, record, and reports that are required under the regulation. Not required for uh, the NTSB and then the other people, but uh, required in here, so. Okay, I'm done. Um, I hope this was something that uh, provided value for you guys. There's gonna be more videos, like I said, join me on Sunday. Or leave your comments down there if you have questions, I'll do my best to answer them tomorrow uh, in the next couple days, um, and today, I guess. Uh, today, today for you is tomorrow for me. Uh, on Sunday, 11.30 Eastern and uh, 8.30 Pacific, uh, I'll be having basically a Q&A, answer all your questions as, as well as I can, and then hopefully having some great discussions with you. So I'll see you then. And in the following week, we'll be talking with Vic Moss and uh, from the DSPA and hopefully answering even more questions then. So that's all I got. Happy New Year. Uh, I hope uh, 2021 is a lot better than 2020 was for many. And, uh, and, I, and I wish everyone a lot of success. I know there's gonna be a lot of things that we need to adapt to with this new regulation, but it's an exciting time. It's an exciting industry that is changing. So regulation changes are gonna happen in the future. This is not the last and this is not the first, this is not the first, this is not the last that we're gonna see regulation changes. So that's it, signing off. And then I will talk to you guys on Sunday morning.